Welcome to Roofing Road Trips, the podcast that takes you on a thrilling journey across the world of roofing. From fascinating interviews with roofing experts to on-the-road adventures, we'll uncover the stories, innovations, and challenges that shape the rooftops over our heads. So fasten your seatbelts and join us as we embark on this exciting roofing road trip. Welcome to Roofing Road Trips from Roofers Coffee Shop. My name is Heidi Ellsworth, and today we are talking about what everyone is talking about in roofing, and that is service programs, service and maintenance. And I tell you what, every contractor wants to elevate their game when it comes to service and maintenance. So we got the experts, Will Riley with Centerpoint Connect and Chad Westbrook with Service Alignment to join us today to talk about this. This is so important. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Happy to be here. I am so excited to have both of you. So let's, before we dive in and start talking about all this, let's start with some introductions. So Will, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company, that'd be great. Yeah. So I, you know, I really started in uh, 2007, 2010 on the software end, implementing roofing contractors, a couple hundred of them. And really for the first seven years, implementing contractors on roofing software exposed me to this service leading mentality that I was really attracted to. I saw a lot of contractors that were implementing a service leading initiative, I'll call it, seemed to me to be really successful. So I, I just, I learned as much as I could outside in. 2017, got an opportunity to go work for a commercial roofing contractor out of Fort Worth, a replacement contractor that did about 12 million. And Dustin wanted to grow through service. What a great opportunity. So I got to sink my teeth into one business and we ended up going from 12 million to to 28 million in a three year period of time. And service is the largest contributor to that growth. Uh, And I could talk about how we did that, but ultimately we had a lot of pain with that growth. We needed software, we needed a system. So we built our own solution from the ground up that was really structured on workflows. As we get into the conversation, I hope we talk more about workflows. But I became so attached to the product that I just had to take it to market. So we did that in 2020. And now we get to work with contractors again and to help them implement their initiatives. And not all of them want to implement and grow through service. That's okay. But I'm extremely passionate about the ones that that do. Yeah. it. You know, it's such an important... And Will, what great experience on all sides of the... Um, you know, uh, all sides of the roofing industry to be able to do that. Chad? Um, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. And tell us about your company. Absolutely. So my name is Chad Westbrook. I'm the founder of Service Alignment, which really focuses on building high-performing service divisions. Uh, much like Will, I've been in the industry almost 20 years, and it's really been the number one thing that I've done. And started on a technology side, had the opportunity, I want to say maybe 2012, to step out into a regional service company to help implement technology into the business. And it's kind of naturally grown from there. Um, I had the opportunity to be at a national company for about six years where I led some of the largest preventative maintenance uh, initiatives across the United States. And then my final stop before going on my own uh, was a company that specialized in a very unique part of the business, uh, which is government, schools, hubs, MBEs, all that kind of different stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. it really graced me with a lot of experience within the industry. And it always focused around the service side, right? It was always about growing revenue, but they wanted to do it in a sustainable way where they had the opportunity not just to have a one and done job, but they can grow the business year over year and have that sustained growth. So that's what led me to be able to open up service alignment where we really focus on building those service initiatives and getting to the point where we can have that foundation or that incubator, right, to be able to get those preventative maintenance, but at the end of the day, grow that private negotiated world uh, that everyone's trying to get. I love it. I love it. Love entrepreneurs right here. This is awesome. This is so great. Um, Okay, let's start with the big picture. Um, Will, let's start with you. What are you seeing in the rise of service and maintenance programs in roofing? Yeah, I think that there's a there's a, an incredible amount of thirst for all things surrounding service. You know, the initial attraction of higher margins or maybe less risk. You know, that's like kind of the start to it. But I think bigger picture, contractors are seeing that that really gets them into the private side. Maybe you're not so much at the whim of you know, bidding jobs or being able to submit bids with, with, you know, more of a competitive edge there, but more so 
doing work on your terms, you know, your plan, your spec, your start date. And I think a lot of that stems from having those service-based relationships. So one thing that I, I have to say on that, Will, is when you talk about the rise of service and maintenance programs, and, and I don't want to tie it into COVID or something around that side, but that's been a really big tipping point where ultimately most of the re-roofs stopped happening, right? And this is the part inside my career when I was on the government side mm -hmm. and any budget that was created in 20, in 2019 or even 2020 was garbage because we all knew 2021, 20, 22, right? It was a different world. No projects were getting awarded. So these companies that were so dependent on all of these big projects, they weren't happening. Right. So everyone started looking elsewhere to be able to say, okay, how can we get revenue? How can I keep my guys working? And service really became that front and center way to be able to say, well, they're not replacing the roof. So what are they doing? You know, they're repairing it. Yeah. And the contractors, uh, especially the ones that I'm working with are, are, are understanding, right? That we, that roofs leak 50 to a hundred times, if not more, right? Depending on what the building's tolerance is before they even think about replacing the roof. So it just yeah. makes sense as you tie in the life cycle, right, of a roof, you put it on, it's not just wait for the next replacement. There's an entire lifespan that allows you to be able to service that customer, stay close to it, right, and and grow it. So there's so much that's evolving within our industry and even understanding what our customers want besides just that next re-roof that they have coming up. I totally agree, right? And, and it's almost like, I think you're you're totally spot on with that too because COVID, you know, the the the, the lockdowns, whatever you want to call it, shined a large light on service. And I would, and I, I looked around the room too, and I saw a lot of service departments were the reason that these companies stayed in business too. You know, but if you look yes. at it, all things that ever need to be repaired will forever need to be repaired. So it, it only really makes sense. You know, what, what you guys are saying is just so good. I mean, I, and I hadn't really thought about it in that COVID sense, you know, that, cause I, I, you know, I can go way back to the great um, repression or um, recession. Let's try it again to the great recession. And, you know, service was the only thing that got through a lot of people through that, but then that you're right. It happened all over again in COVID um, and contractors are not stopping that. And so now building owners are used to that are used to having that kind of service and maintenance and really that long-term plan. So it, it's something that's not going to go away. Absolutely not, right? No question. I feel like you said, like it's shining the light on it, right? And the, the part, service has always been a part of the business process, right? That I've always been a part of. But what I was able to do, and this is way, you know, way pre-COVID, is that service allows you to be able to scale with a customer, right? Just because you do one re-roof, doesn't mean you got to wait for the next one. They can have 20, 30, 50, 100 other buildings, right? So when we talk about some of the, the maintenance and service agreements that we've had inside place, it all started with one leak call, right? And one leak call that the customer didn't want to happen. So that that's where it started getting bigger. And then that private side grows, right? To where I'm the first person that gets the phone call when it's time to replace the roof, or I'm the first person that says, hey, man, I, you know, we can't tolerate any more water. Now I'm first in line, not second or third. So you kind of already covered this a little bit on why or the how it kind of really, you know, we saw it get started in the early 2000s where people were doing service and maintenance, but really why it's taken this leap where everybody is getting involved um, through that COVID. But there's a lot of other reasons why to start a service and maintenance program. So Chad, kind of go, th if you can, share a little bit going through those um, reasons. Absolutely. So the, the first one and the one that instantly comes to mind is reoccurring revenue. So when I think about reoccurring revenue, like our sales teams do nothing but fight every single day to get an opportunity to get on the roof, right? Or to find somebody with a problem or goal that they can solve so they can sell something so they can hit their goals, the company can run all that fun stuff, right? But with preventative maintenance agreements, it allows you to be able to get on that roof one, two, four times, whatever it is per year. Right? And not only are you performing a service to help clean out drains or sealants or fasteners or whatever it might be, but it's giving you the opportunity to get back on that roof, kind of see how it's starting to degrade or age, which ultimately is exactly what your salesmen are trying to do. So reoccurring revenue is a huge part of that. You know, I always say, you know, January 1st, what do you have sold? And any contractor that has no reoccurring revenue or maintenance agreements inside place, I mean, they're waiting for the first contract to come through. However, the ones that have those maintenance agreements inside place, they can say, hey, we already have 
you know, five hundred thousand dollars in inspections pre-sold that they know they're going to do, and then on top of that is the work that comes back from that, right? Not just cleaning the drains, but as that roof continues to age. So I would say reoccurring revenue is the first one that comes to mind on why someone would want to start, you know, a service and maintenance program. For sure. And I think even future too, right? Future, it, it, you know, beyond the right here, the right now, it's about retaining those roofs. You know, if you look at it this way, every building you get on, ideally, you want to stick a flag in it and say, this is, this is my roof. I'm the one that takes care of this building and all the occupants within the building. And the more roofs you can get on and put flags in, the more future sales will take place. And I always believe in doing the right thing for the customer. It's not like you're out there trying to sell things that that the client doesn't really need. But if you gather data factually and you review it with the client, and when I say gather data factually, I mean like all of the facts, walking a roof, identifying all of what's an emergency type repair work, what's future repair work, and what's that cost to replace that asset and bring that to the client that good is a result from doing that. And I think if you do it over and over and over again, you're retaining the roofs, but you're also putting future sales on the board that, that aren't, aren't you know, solidified just yet. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. And flash that, that flag in when you put it in the roof. Just make sure you, you correct the flash. <laughs> <to you. laughs> I respect. Um, I it. So what you were saying reminded me. So if this was back 2012, 14, something like that where you talked about the data side of it. So this was in central US and we had inspected, forgot what it was. It was the biggest inspection initiative, right? And we inspected, it was like 150 buildings, average two sections per building. So we inspected 300 sections. And the whole reason that we did that was we wanted a very good re-roof or production forecast. So we got on top of 300 roofs. We put a projected replacement on 300 roofs. Now, yes, some of them were 15 years out, but guess what? That's right now. So what we did is we inspected these 300 roofs, and now all of a sudden we had 300 roofs that we knew were going to get replaced, right? The only question was mm-hmm. when. And like that was one of the coolest things that we put together to be able to see what was the age of the roof, and then also when were these roofs going to be projected for replacement? Because that just feeds back into like, again, how healthy the business is going to be in one, three, five, 10 years. So that data is a huge part of it. Yeah. I mean, when, when I think about to that point and well, I'd like, you know, but when I think about how many roofing contractors every year are having their building owners or negotiated work, asking them to give them budgets, asking them to talk about this certain roof, whereas with service and maintenance, you may be able to get all of this in place. So, Will, that seems to me that that is just the best way to really maintain those relationships. I, I, I couldn't agree more, right? And so much of the industry, or maybe what people are just used to doing is, is using their expertise, coming up with a quote, and then delivering that quote. But if you look a little bit broader in terms of kind of what Chad's talking about, those 150 inspections, that was about collecting and retaining data that helps your clients, but also helps you, you know, creating those win-win-win type scenarios. So instead of just firing off that one quote based on that roofer's experience, which probably and mostly would be the right thing to do, but but shining light on the rest of the facts, I think, is, is really the biggest piece that contributes to it. Yeah, and working hand in hand. And that's what it's a good service program and enables for all of the work that's coming through. But having watched this for many years, I know it's not always easy to bring in new software, to bring in a new culture of service, to even start a service and maintenance program. So, Will, let's let's kind of dive into what are the cultural and process changes that need to be made for roofing contractors to be successful with a service and maintenance program? Good question, right? And, and, and ultimately, that's what I experienced when I joined the roofing company in 2017. We, we, we had a couple of service trucks, but really it was the Chase warranty work. We did $12 million. And what I think most encounter is, is their organization, especially a re-roof or bidding-based roofing organization, their entire structure exists based on making those re-roof sales, meaning the estimators, the sales reps, their comp plan is based around selling new roofs. So what you got to do is, is open up the reasons why we should even get into service and then have the team embrace that why. If they don't understand why they should collect all these other 
you know, repair and, and identify all the repairs and, and put pricing to all the repairs and life expectancy and budgets for replacement. If they don't understand the why, then they're just not going to do it. And I think it poises a lot of challenges for especially these these companies that have been in business for so long because that's a big culture shock. You know, and if you think about it this way, you've got potentially service guys on and off roofs, you've got sales reps, estimators, project managers on and off roofs. And in a perfect world, they're all contributing to the overarching mission, which is that why. So I think that's kind of the biggest piece is getting that that understanding and, and having every employee believe in it. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive part. So you're talking about like getting everybody in to understand the why. And the first thing that always came to my head is photos. And that's what I always run into technicians, right? They're like, I don't understand. I can't, I, I took photos. Why are they not right? And then you get even further into this, mm-hmm. right? And then on the sales side of why do we want to implement service? That's because everybody doesn't need a new roof. Just because they call in and they have a roof leak, right? Doesn't mean that you have to go out there and quote a new roof, let alone the cost of that roof. I mean, it's insane to think that someone would spend a quarter of a million dollars, half, one, whatever the dollar amount is. That's insane to see that there's a problem big enough that someone's going to spend a quarter of a million dollars to fix it. But it's happening every day, right? So like the integrity part is a huge part of that. Not everybody needs a new roof, right? What can we do with the money they have? And a lot of times not putting that new roof on gets you a longer, more, you know, more trusting customer client relationship than you would even replacing that roof. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to follow up with that. You know, contractors, not only not, does not everyone not need a new roof, but contract just kind of like, I, I loved what you're, you said earlier, like put a flag in it, right? So really owning mm-hmm. that roof, Chad, I mean, that's really what it's about, right? It is. It is, it is. And and what Will said when he was talking about the why, um, one thing that I wanted to, to talk about, which was insanely and still is insanely uh, successful for me is something called act as if. And I say this to every single employee, right? When you run into a situation, act as if it was yours. Act as if. Yeah. If this was your building, would you get off? If this was your building, would you ignore the fasteners that was missing, the sealant that was failing, right? If this And it doesn't even have to be yours. If this was your mom's, your grandma's, like, what would you do if it was yours? And when you start okay. thinking with that integrity, that's where service comes from, right? Service is about doing the right thing when no one's looking because most of the time you're up there, maybe you and your second that's there, and the client's expecting you to be able to help get their roof to a leak-free condition. So that act as if is a huge part that I've implemented into businesses that have just such a great way to be able to answer questions as everyone kind of navigates what is service, right? Service is act as if, act as if this is your building, what would you do, right? And then that's, that's how you start, you're really embracing that why. And, and Will, I mean, really to get that culture, it's really about the processes, right? It is. And I think that the processes ultimately need to support the end game. You know, you can tell everybody that you want them to gather more pictures and bring them back to the office. But if they're not following the right processes, it's going to get bottlenecked. It'll get clogged, the ball get dropped. You know, I think that having the processes, and it could be really simple too, you know, hey, every time we're fixing a leak, I want you to also look around. And if you see something, this is what you do. You do X, Y, and Z. And it goes to the service manager. And the service manager, you're either going to, if it's a house account, you're going to deal with it yourself. If it's not, you're going to pass to an account manager. Like having those processes installed and then just manage the systems. So I think that helps support the culture coupled with what Chad's talking about, act as if, coupled with understanding the why, that all together, I think is what's going to help create real success. Yeah, really. Well, you know what, Will, one of the things that I've always said is you don't have to really understand technology, but you have to understand what questions to ask. And I Mm -hmm. think that's the hardest part, right? What are the questions that contractors out there, and let's just be honest, contractors have gone through a couple, a number of contractors have gone through a couple of different softwares where they weren't happy. And so what are the questions that they need to ask? I would love for you to kind of spell that out you know, some of your, the top three questions are around there of what contractors should be asking a software company. I think even before they start asking questions that they look inside of their business and identify what their workflows are, you know, because that's going to create a good 
place to even ask questions from. Because then you can ask about the software provider, hey, do you cater to this type of workflow progression? Do you have this level of visibility on work orders I have in backlog or maybe jobs that you know need to get billed or jobs I need to go back and punch out on? I think a lot of the time when I'm sitting down with the contractor and they haven't thought through their workflows, that we're flushing it out. Or at least that's what I help them do. You know, even if we're not even, even if they're not ready for software, I still want to help them flush out their, their workflows because as you're looking at bringing on or implementing new software, it makes owners think about their business. And they're like, wait a minute, hold on. Let's kind of slow this down a little bit. You know, last thing we need to do yeah. is buy new software and expect it to just magically cure all the, the, the issues. It's just not going to do that. Point on that, that, that technology doesn't fix a process problem. Right. So, so when we're going in and when I go into companies, right, it's about four things. One is people, right? Who do you have? Where are they sitting on the bus? Right. Uh, 101. Then we go into process. And in process, I don't allow technology in it. So, how do the people work together? How do you get it from I have a roof leak all the way over to money in the bank? Right. Because just because it's invoice doesn't mean it's done. Right. You got to have cash in the bank. Then when you bring technology in as step three, technology makes things better, easier, and faster, right? It's like, well, I got to fill this paper ticket out and I got to give this paper ticket to my technician and then he's got to take a picture on his digital camera. Like those were the days, but there's so much technology out there that there's like so much flashy stuff that it's really cool to walk through IRE and be like, oh man, that's awesome. I need that. I need that. I need that. But then what I find is that People are, are buying technology to fix what is truly a process problem, or sometimes even as deep as a people problem, right? And, mm-hmm. and those are the mm-hmm. four things, right? So people, process, technology, and then once you have those three together, then you can start setting goals. Uh, but until you have those first three outlined, um, goals just create confusion, you know, more than clarity and confidence. Chat, I love that. I love it. I'm just sitting here thinking through that and I just love it because I think it's so true. And I've seen it so many times where they think, oh, we get the software, everything's going to be fixed. No, because bad data in, bad data out. And um, so besides the technology, what would you say um, is the most common challenges that roofing companies face when they're trying to start or even elevate their service division? So, Chad, what have you seen? I, I deal with this every day. It's the work. Service is not easy, right? Everyone sees it and it might look pretty, right, from in front of the curtain. But when you pull it back, uh, yes, service is very, very profitable. Yes, service will give you more capital projects. But when you think about a production project that lasts three months, right, you might have three weeks or a month to be able to load the project. You got 30 minutes, Right, you got you got literally three minutes once you get in before the customer experience automatically starts, and the experience that your customer has. I I, I always say the customer's uh, vision is their reality. What they see is their reality. They don't see the roof. That's the hardest part. Is that you know we call it the buyer seller disconnect. Is that as a roofer we're always trying to sell roof repairs, but your client's just looking at a stained ceiling tile. He's just looking at water on the floor. Right. So as a roofing company, you have to be able to understand your clients or prospects reality of what they see, plus what we're doing on the roof. And then I think that's really, yeah. you know, almost on that last question, how does technology help? I think technology uh, meshes those two, right? To be able to say, okay, here's the problem. Here's how we fixed it. Um, and here's how, you know, it looked in your building. So I think the work I, that, is, is huge. That has changed a lot. The ability to really show the roof to owners whether they're two stories down in an office or whether they're across the country to be able to say, this is the problem and really do that visually or through FaceTime or whatever through, you know, your soft, your project management software. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think that is, that's a huge mm-hmm. point. You're hundred percent right. So what, what I say is if the secretary or whoever it is that is at the front desk, if you can't give your supporting documents to them and they clearly know what you did. There's a puncture, there's a hole, you put a patch on top of the hole, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, but that's how easy your supporting documents can be. Anything more difficult than that, more than likely is going to make your customer, who 99% of the time is not a roofing expert, confused. It's got to be simple, right? And sometimes that makes it harder for us as contractors. It is harder for us. Yes, we do have to take four specific photos. Yes, they have to be very you know, unique on how we put them and how 
Yes, there's a big difference between a puncture and a slit. There's a massive difference, right? We, yes, there's a massive difference between a puncture in the field and a puncture three foot away from an HVAC unit. Massive difference. Oh, yeah. Those are all things that yeah. we deal with in the field that your, the customer might not understand. But when it comes to what I'll say, the top 1% of contractors can come back and say, hey, this puncture was caused by your HVAC technician. I know that because of X, right? Or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's, that's when service really starts becoming, right, the driver of your company. So, Will, when you look at that, and, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to kind of go back around to what we talked about earlier, because I think we need to hit this just one more time when it, about common challenges. But if you're, let's talk about current culture of a business before they get a service and how, how challenging is that? I think it's, ex- I mean, it's extremely challenging. I know it is, you know, especially for a, a contractor that does not have a, a true service division, you know, and, and I'm separating that out from, you know, chasing warranty work, you know, because we, if we install roofs, we have to be able to back up our warranties. But from an idea that is in an owner's head that says, I want to bolt on a service division, you can't just copy and paste what you already have. It's a completely different animal. You know, you, you don't bid the work the same way. You know, you don't, it, it's extremely transactional. It's more slower. It's more methodical. You can't pull a guy off a production crew who's used to banging out squares and put him in a, in a service truck and expect him to take care of a customer. It's more, it's slower, more methodical, customer service oriented. And then the people that manage those, those crews need to be different than the people managing the production crews. So I think from a culture standpoint, like, yeah, very diverse set of people in order to run, you know, ultimately the whole, the the organization, but it's not a copy paste, you know, all the way down to how you bid a re-roof isn't the same way you bid a repair job. I mean, it can be, but if you really want to scale that effort, you need to adopt unit pricing. You know, you need to be able to onboard more account managers that can identify deficiencies and price them quicker and get approval quicker, you know, and, and that's how yeah. you're able to turn the volume up. One of the things that I always think about when we're talking about service technicians, um, cause I think your point about, you know, you can't just take somebody from one crew to put them in there, but service technicians seem like such a great job for the next generation. I mean, when you have, um, young people coming out of vocational schools or coming out of even high school, but definitely community college and college. Um, that is like a great job because so much technology is involved, critical thinking, not that other parts of the company don't have critical thinking. Don't take me wrong on that. Mm. But um, it just seems as I've been watching this, it seems like such a great entry point for young people into the roofing industry. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very attractive industry to be participating in. And I love the industry and, and all the roofers that I've ever met are brilliant, right? They're, they're experts in their trade. The service technicians, I would actually contribute the majority of what I know now about roofing to the service techs that we had. They were patient with me. They were willing to share, you know, they want to tell you what they know. And, and, and I think that's, that's, yeah. They're proud of, you know, they're proud of it and they're proud to bring on helpers and teach them everything that they know. And then they, and then those helpers become their own service techs and then they have a whole career ahead of them. So it's such a cool thing to see. Yeah, it is. It is so cool. I love this. Um, okay, Chad, I always like to end our podcast with how, how, how do people who want to, how do roofing companies that want to start their own service and maintenance, where is the best place to get resources? How do they get started? So I'll start with a pen and a piece of paper. And I know no one's going to enjoy that. But after all, this company, right? If you're a leader, a manager, whatever it is, you got to start with the vision. You got to understand where you're going. Otherwise, you're going to constantly break it and have to rebuild it. Or you're going to change course in the middle of it. And at no point do your employees love changing course in the middle of what they thought they were doing. Um, so there's a massive mm-hmm. difference, right? I've, I've had 500 plus preventative maintenance agreements that were executed across the entire U.S. You guys might sa- you might say, wow, that's awesome. But I can tell you, it's not fun getting up to Oregon from Chicago or getting to Maine or wherever it is, right? When you don't have locations out there, you got one truck that's driving across the U.S. or you have to have a resource network to be able to do it. And, and I'm explaining all of this stuff to you because... It has to be your vision, 
right? If, if you are what I would consider a territory titan within a certain metro, that's awesome. Most of the time, you can build 500 service agreements. There's 500 buildings that I'm sure you guys are on right in your territory. And if that's your yeah. vision, it's beautiful. The other thing I'll say is that you have to understand why. So Will talked a lot about why. This goes to your customer. Why would your customer want a maintenance program? And there's there's so many times where I see contractors thinking that if they tell somebody, you know, I got a preventative maintenance program that the client's going to jump all over it. But in reality, your customer's paying you for something and getting nothing because they don't have a leak. They don't have a problem. And they're gonna, you're going to go up on the roof. You're going to do an inspection. You're going to clean some drains out. And guess what? They didn't have a problem, which goes right back to their perception as their reality. And the one thing I was going to share, uh, which was, again, this is a little while back, but it was a self-storage company where um, I had sold I think about 350 service agreements. And I'll spare you all the details to it. But the reason they bought is because they had a manager at the, at the location climb a stepladder to try to clean out gutters fell off the stepladder, broke her leg, publicly traded company, sued as public traded company. Obviously, think of what that did. And they put a mandate that yeah. no one can climb a stepladder over two steps throughout the entire company, which had 300 and something locations. I tell you guys that because wow. it had nothing to do with roofing. It had to do with a manager, right? So it's like you have to understand the why behind so much. Right, your customer is not just going to buy a preventative maintenance program because you think it's great. What is it that they're going to get out of it? So I think those are two things. Start with a oh. piece of paper. Find out what your vision is, right? Because you got to be able to know where you're going, and then from there you got to understand why is your customer going to buy it. That makes so much sense. That makes so much sense. So, Will Centerpoint offers the software, the experience you guys work with on processes. How can people? You know, what is first steps for some of these companies that are like, okay, I want to start service maintenance. I know I need software, or maybe they've already started service maintenance and now they're like ready to take that next step to the software. How do they get started? What's some of your recommendations on for um, how they can bring that kind of software into their business? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the quest for discovering your why, you know, participating in industry events and, and more specifically, gravitate towards the service conversations. There's classes, there's, there's dialogue, there's, there's peer groups, there's a lot of conversation around service. So understand your why. Once you have your why, then it's about putting the systems in place. Could you run a service division off a spreadsheet? Absolutely. Is it going to suck? Definitely. You know, and that's where, where we try to come in and say, you, let's, let's talk with the contractor and, and figure out kind of what their need is. You know, we have solutions all the way from entry level all the way up to you know, very robust and customizable, you know, so, so part of what we want to do is see if, see what the contractor's initiatives are and then align to see if we can help them. I love it. I love it. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This is a wealth of knowledge. Great podcast. I just loved it. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, I want to have you back another time so we can keep talking about this. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I love it. And thank you all for listening. This is the kind of information that can grow your business. And that's the whole idea. These podcasts are about thought leadership. They're about growing your business, finding out what's happening out there in the roofing industry. So be sure to check out the Centerpoint directory on Roofers Coffee Shop, where you can get all of this information. And also check out all of the podcasts under our RLW initiative under Roofing Road Trips. And definitely on your favorite podcast channel, be sure to subscribe and set your notifications so you don't miss a single episode. We'll be seeing you next time on Roofing Road Trips. If you've enjoyed the ride, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join us on every roofing adventure make sure to visit rooferscoffeeshop.com to learn more. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next roofing road trip.